Saturday wind southwest 25 knots. Saturday night wind southwest 20 to 30 knots. I was really scared, I was really frightened. It was very cold, it was windy, there were huge seas. I was inexperienced. I, I had full faith in the chickadee, full faith in her integrity. However, my skills at the time were very limited. My maiden voyage caught between a hurricane and a hard place. began in uh, southeastern BC and having spent a couple of years coal mining I wanted to see the world. Left Line Creek coal mines and when traveling spent uh, six months in Australia, traveled around Australia extensively, ended up sailing on a vessel by the name of Lady Guy across the Indian Ocean to South Africa and uh, traveled during the peak of apartheid and went into some communities, giving out little gifts along the way. He came back from that trip, he was gone a year. He quit the mine and he was gone exactly a year. He got hired back at the mine a year to the day almost that he left and said, he's buying his own sailboat. It's gonna sail around the world, he, that was it. I was the program coordinator for the local Rotary Club and uh, we, we're, we would bring in speakers for our noon luncheon meetings, and uh, I brought Eric in as a speaker. But I had heard about him, this young lad, you know, uh, what, 540 miles from the coast, building a 30-foot sailboat and uh, planning to sail around the world. And he asked me if I can give him a spot here to uh, build a boat for a couple of months. I told him, no problem, I'd show him the spot that I can... Uh, provide for uh, that it doesn't interfere with the business over here and uh, of course the couple of months became about uh, close to three years. It's because I thought it would only take six months you see and so I would work for six months every day on my days off and the boat was nowhere near completion and then I would say six months I'm gonna finish this boat another six months I would work like crazy and the boat was not finished so every six months you know, of course, eight of eight six-month segments went by, four years had passed. I think he lived like a hermit, you know, like he lived in the little trailer. he come in here every day, he needed a sander or a, a nailer or something. Uh, and uh, whatever I can help him, I help him to build a boat because he told me exactly what he's going to do with the boat. We loaded it up. Trucked it out to Vancouver, continuing on with other jobs, working on fishing boats off the Pacific Northwest. I uh, worked on the oil rigs up in northern BC. He didn't have much money when he started, and uh, I guess that's that was the major thing is uh, to get enough money to uh, get going. I was heading home to Cranbrook to do a slide presentation at a school to talk about my voyage, to talk about this Friendship Box program at the time, care packages, the idea of getting gifts together and so on. So I was going to visit a school and uh, traveling along on the uh, highway number three outside of Osoyas. Fog, snow, sleet. I'm crawling on uphill with a, with a little, Nissan, uh, little Nissan car and a truck coming downhill the opposite direction, just nailed me head on. And that was it. I woke up in a hospital. I had a, another challenge that I had to overcome to meet my departure date, which of course, when I came to realize that this was not going to happen after all the years of working and, and you know building the boat and saving up the cruising kitty and just putting everything together to find out that 
the voyage simply was not going to happen as planned. Uh, you know, after I realized that, well, we took it to the next step. I was working at the Ministry of Education at the time, and uh, we got a call from an MLA who told us about Eric. So at the time, I was doing some writing for BC Education News. It was a newsletter that went out to all the teachers in various schools around the province. And I was assigned to write a story about Eric. So I gave him a call, and I interviewed him, and I wrote the story. And what struck me about Eric was he was just, he seemed so young, he was so naive, and he was so full of enthusiasm. It just kind of run, rubbed off on us. And after we got to know him a little bit, we all wanted to help him out. The friendship boxes began in, in Cranbrook. There was publicity around that in my hometown, and we had numerous schools that suddenly became involved in this program. And then it, uh, it was written up in the Ministry of Education newsletter and then suddenly we had friendship boxes from across the province coming on board the chickening for this this voyage you see uh, and I was sponsored by IBM to send reports back via laptop to the World Wide Web keep in touch with the schools and those that have put their friendship boxes on board so one thing sort of led to another and, and suddenly I, I have this this uh, program on my hands to deliver friendship boxes and, and maintain, a, maintain reports on a website. I placed the shoe boxes, friendship boxes, on the port side of the vessel in one of the lockers there. To my amazement here, you know, I, it brought tears to my eyes, really. I went down below deck and here is, he's got this little wee bunk and a little wee stove and it's, the, the ship is jammed with thousands of shoe boxes with school supplies and I, I said to him, you're, you're really going to do this? He said, well, but even in a few hours, I'm off. I finally set sail out of Vancouver on November 18th. And I set sail over to Victoria. The weather was so, so bad at this time of the year. It was cold, it was wet, it was raining. I could not set sail until there was an opening in the weather. I finally left Victoria somewhere in the last week of November and safely made it across the Strait of Juan de Fuca to Nia Bay. All the shoe boxes are warm, cozy and dry and waiting for a new home in Central America. And the first leg of this journey has completed here at Nia Bay, the second, uh, second leg begins tomorrow. It was December 5th when I was finally able to exit the Strait of Juan de Fuca and sail out into the Pacific. Unfortunately, between two storm fronts, the storm front from Alaska came down as I was heading down the coast of Oregon and I encountered uh, some, some rather uh, heavy weather. I was frightened to go out on deck to reduce the sail. I was carrying more sail than I should have. The boat was broaching in heavy seas. Three o'clock in the morning, pitch black, seas washing over the deck of the boat. I had literally had to put up for the first time a storm tri sail and put up a storm head sail just to keep the boat uh, from you know to keep the boat in balance. It, it, it was frightening. It was frightening. It was a cold, frightening experience. Continued my voyage on down the coast, made it to San Francisco, sailed in to San Francisco. Uh, uh, one of my finest experiences uh, along the journey. I had rounded Bodega Point. The weather was a little bit rough, 40 knots of wind, no worries. I had all sails configured accordingly. The wind just died and then the fog set in. Set a course for underneath the Golden Gate Bridge, and suddenly, uh, around one o'clock in the afternoon, the fog burnt off, and uh, there above me was the Golden Gate Bridge. 
little bit of breeze came up, I hoisted sail and I sailed underneath the Golden Gate Bridge. I was one of the happiest people alive. I was really, really happy. And I knew at that point, when I sailed underneath the Golden Gate Bridge, the journey, you know, the journey will continue from start till finish. I love you. I love you all. I left San Francisco with another 1520 friendship box on board and set a course for Mexico. I caught a Santa Ana wind. Santa Ana winds blow very, very strong, bursting out of the east. And uh, I was battling this, this very dry, hot, dusty wind and uh, tired and fatigued after a couple days. I set a course for the next nearest port of call, which was Dana Point. I met the local Rotarians in, uh, in Dana Point and uh, was introduced to a gentleman by the name of Ted Bowersox. And um, Ted and a few other Rotarians came on down to the harbor in Dana Point and came aboard the Chickadee and noticed, you know, all the friendship boxes down below. And I got to know them quite well and they made me an honorary Rotarian uh, at the club. I, true honor, a fantastic honor. With that, I continued on and gained support from many other Rotary Clubs. At this point, we formed the World Kids Foundation, and off we went. I started to deliver some friendship boxes in the first port of call of Ensenada, went to an orphanage, as a matter of fact, called the Olive Tree uh, Children's Home. It was one of the finest feelings. It's like, yes, this works. We've made our first connection. Pulled into Mexico, and I've been doing some work here, visited a couple orphanages uh, just outside of Ensenada. That was really exciting. Tomorrow, I'm going to another little orphanage just uh, north of here. Hola, mi nombre es Brianna. Yo me gusto a recibir muchas cosas. <laughs> Ella me gusta recibir cosas también como nosotros. <laughs> Hola, mi nombre es Joshua. Joshua. Tengo, tengo un regalo para ti de un lápiz y una borrador. Uh, Alpha Zulu, this is uh, the Chickadee, Chickadee, um, Charlie Fox, Charlie Lima, 5480, I copy, over. Do you have any idea how many miles you are south of San Diego, over? Yeah, about um, an estimation, I'd say approximately uh, 300, 300 miles south of uh, San Diego, and approximately 90, uh, 90 to 100 miles off the coast. This is uh, Chickadee, Charlie, Fox, Charlie, Mott, 5480, uh, here. Sailed uh, up to La Paz, Mexico, delivered some French boxes, and continued up the coast to Puerto Escondido. En route to Puerto Escondido and the, the Sea of Cortez, a uh, squid got into my toilet and plugged up the toilet, which is actually called a head in nautical terms on a sailing vessel. This toilet was now non-functional because of the squid, so I had to dismantle the toilet, put it on deck while I'm cruising along under sail on a very, very hot day. In frustration, I accidentally threw the toilet overboard, so suddenly I'm I am without a toilet on my vessel. It's 
really uncomfortable not having a toilet on the boat, I will head back to uh, Tijuana and uh, in search of a new toilet. I pack up all my gear and um, I'm waiting at the bus station, Mexico, the bus is to come by for a bus to carry me north. And this bus comes rumbling in to the bus station, dust and diesel trailing in its, uh, in its uh, transom. Uh, then the bus parks, you know, in typical standard affair, the little Mexican bus station people racing to get on and off, and there's no lineups, it's, it's first, first on, first serve, first seat. So people are clogging up the door, and there's a lot of chaos and this and that, and uh, I can hear this meowing sound behind the rumbling of the engine, this little, little, tiny, little kitten crying. And uh, I stop and I listen, I say, no, this can't be. And I get down on my knees and I crawl underneath the bus and there's this little, small, gray uh, fur ball <laughs> up on the leaf springs of, of the bus's uh, suspension. And uh, there's these fan belts turning around and all this, you know, the engine's just rev revving and the bus driver's up there honking his horn, beeping his horn. And so I figure, oh, little cat, I see this little kitten. So I, I, I reach out and I grab, grab hold of this little fur ball and I, I surface with this little kitten. It's all dirty and dusty and covered with oil and grease. And, and, and this little, little kitten is, is, is clawing on me. And I look at this and I said, this is a survivor, this cat, is my companion. There's my first mate. I ran across the street to some friends that were running a laundry and I says, look after this cat, I'll be back in a week. So I got back on the bus, raced to the north, got my toilet, came back, and that's the story of how Diesel and I first met. There was some adjustment, but after some discussion with Diesel and a little bit of formal training, she found her place and turned into one very fine companion. Well, we're gonna get hit with something. It's spun around and it's coming back. After six weeks in El Salvador, and several friendship boxes later, I continued on down the coast en route for Costa Rica. I was going to bypass Nicaragua. There were uh, squalls building up on the horizon and sweeping on down, hitting the chickadee hard. So when I was off the coast of Nicaragua, I looked on the charts and saw this bay of San Juan del Sur. Although I just wanted to rest up for 24 hours, however, the process of clearing customs and immigration was so, at the time, complex. Once I had uh, followed through the formalities, three days had passed. It was a nice little town, so I chose to uh, stay and, and spend some time there. I first met Eric, if I remember correctly, it was at Ricardo's bar and this young clean cut guy come in there and he was reading. And Eric always carries a clipboard, you know, he's always writing things down, right? I think he's got so much going that uh, he has to either keep, keep his laptop with him or his, his clipboard with his notebook. And uh, that's sort of my first memory of Eric, meeting him in Ricardo's. Uh, he was having a beer and I was having a beer and we got talking. Discovered he was from Cranbrook, BC. We had something in common, then he told me that was his little red sailboat out in the harbor. 
He told me that he was on a, on a trip around the world uh, doing some kids' voyage thing, so uh, I expected him to be gone by the next week. Dad was working in southern Peru back in the uh, 70s, and uh, we were living in a small mining town high up in the Andes. As a result, I, I had a, uh, an early taste of, of Latin culture and, uh, and, and also an awareness of poverty in the third world. Although, uh, as a 12-year-old, I could not quite understand this difference. Our town of Viacojone was well-equipped whereas outside of this company town, in the villages down below, the people live very humbly. I was, as a youngster, um, always aware of these differences and never, never quite understanding when we would go into the markets and so on. I could never quite understand, you know, how children my own age would not be attending school or were in rags or were, were undernourished or, you know, in, 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 in very serious dire pain and not really understanding why is that. Little Dali School in, in Chase, British Columbia put together a great friendship box and sent it on down here to Nicaragua. Delivered the friendship box to this little school, Azul Blanco, and they took the time to translate all the letters from English to uh, Spanish and uh, wrote back to uh, Chase, BC. They went beyond the call of duty and the, the kids and the teachers and staff did a bake sale and penny drive and collected up, you know, a couple hundred dollars worth of pennies and uh, sent it on down to the school down here. Last year, um, kids in Mrs. Daly's class, um, made fun of the friendship boxes to send to Nicaragua. Eric had mentioned that um, the kids down there wear uniforms and sometimes if they don't, if the parents don't have money for uniforms, they can't go to school. We were able to um, get uniforms for, I don't know, I think it was 20 kids or something, and, and send those down. Right here is Nicaragua, and right here is Canada, and right, right here is about where we live. I think it's made an impact just on their um, understanding of other another culture and as far as building their own self-esteem it's made a difference in that way too and he built his boat by his self they're little people but they can make a big difference somewhere in the world for for other children well i really see it makes them feel good to know that they can help other children out in other countries that aren't quite as fortunate as we are here um, Sometimes, you know, as parents, we hear, well, you know, we don't have things or we, don't, we can't do this. And when they can see actually how much they really have compared to other countries, it really has great understanding and opens their eyes a bit better and yeah, makes them feel so good, you know, to be able to do the little things they're doing and have it amount to so much. Bradley. Um, There's uh, schools across Canada and the U.S. that are following us on the Internet on the World Kids Voyage website. And uh, every once in a while, a friendship box uh, finds its way down here. Uh, apart from the hunters that I've delivered that were on board from the Chickadee, now there are friendship box coming from all directions, northeast, west, and south. I didn't get to know him very well uh, for a few months, uh, but he, he seemed to be hanging around. And then one day I was talking to him, he said, uh, I said, when are you leaving, Eric? He says, well, I'm building this school. So uh, that sort of astounded me a little bit because we'd been here for a while and I had no inclination about wanting to build a school, but Eric did. He was on a trip around the world and he's building a school. I heard about Cangrejo through a friend in San Juan del Sur who uh, had spoke of this village and the need for a school out here in the camp. Some of the community women came in and were asking if we would 
go out to the village. And we rode in on horseback. It was fantastic, um, beautiful country, great trail ride. I thought, wow, what a great adventure, you know, just hiking through the, uh, the woods on, on horseback, very remote community. Uh, arrived in the village and, and all these uh, children were running around and, uh, you know, you could see that the illiteracy rate was very high. I just made a, a decision at, at that moment that if you need a school, well, uh, I'll do what I can and uh, we'll, uh, we'll build you a school. La escuela nosotros necesitamos porque nuestros padres eh, no aprendieron porque no había una escuela. Eh, no tenían la facilidad su padre a mandarlo a San Juan del Sur a estudiar porque eh, ellos, ellos ocupaban a sus hijos para que les vaya a ayudar a trabajar, a sembrar maíz, a sembrar arroz. Entonces ellos no podían sacar a sus hijos y nadie podía Nadie hacía como hacer una escuela de cangrejo, porque era pequeño. Eric me visitó a la oficina exponiéndome la inquietud de querer ayudar a la comunidad de cangrejo. Es una comunidad muy pobre con niños que no tenían escuela ni había maestro. Me comprometí con Eric que si el hermanamiento de Canadá quería construir la escuela en Cangrejo, nosotros como Ministerio de Educación poníamos el maestro. The funding came from various sources. Uh, I did my best to get funds from whatever location, however we could channel the energy. Uh, possible. Uh, this, this was the approach, and the, the primary leaders in funding the school, Rotary, has just been a godsend. Various schools across Canada and the U.S., contributions from the Ontario Teachers Federation, BC Teachers Federation. We've had funds uh, from Victoria, Runners of Compassion, just so many numerous sources, private contributors, a lot of love and a lot of heart, a lot of spirit that shared in the vision. Fundraising was tough and arduous and slow, but also exciting. The secondary challenge was uh, basically bringing the material into the village. Uh, rainy season, uh, just the logistics involved in, in coordinating uh, the building material in San Juan del Sur, getting it down here to the trailhead, coordinating the ox carts and the horsemen to meet us at the trailhead when there's no phones, no communication link between San Juan del Sur and and, and Cangrejo, so uh, all messages were written in advance by Pony Express in little letters and handed from one horseman to the next, to one person to the next, that finally, eventually, the letter would get to the village and, and Martin would come out with the horses and the oxen and, and uh, off we'd go. During some very difficult times, thank God for, for the Canadian International Development Agency, right at uh, a very critical moment when uh, we needed a house for the teacher, the teacher was having a hard time, we uh, made a proposal to, to CETA to help with the building of a teacher's house and also with other, uh, other various uh, needs that we needed for the school. Uh, the, uh, the wire mesh windows, uh, 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 improvements to the desks and bookshelves, and, and um, so CETA came to the rescue and made a very generous con contribution that helped us build the school, and also you know the teacher's house, very important. Ha sido muy positivo la idea del hermanamiento de Canadá. Ahora los niños reciben la educación en una aula especial con su maestra, no tienen ya que viajar demasiado largo para ir a recibir la educación, ahora la tienen en su propia comunidad. Eh, lo sentimos eh, no como un amigo, sino como un hermano, como un hermano lo sentimos 
de que Él ha luchado con nosotros y lo ha dado la mano, como dicen, ya de que no lo ha dejado, es eh, eh, decir, solo, eh, porque Él tuvo un tiempo que se fue, porque cuando Él dijo, sí, voy a ayudarles, muchacho a hacer esta escuela, yo me voy a ir a Canadá hoy, voy a, y después yo voy a venir. Eh, eh, nosotros mirábamos de que, ¿será cierto o, o será no, no será cierto? Pero cuando Él vino, ¡ah, sí! Entonces, por ese causa nosotros decimos, es como un hermano, porque se fue y no lo olvidó. Siempre estaba en el acuerdo que sí, Cangrejo necesitaba una escuela. One of our dreams for this remote region of Nicaragua is to build a small centro de salud, a small health center, or maybe even a first aid station, if you will, where basic first aid can be administered, basic health, uh, vitamins provided for all the children, a place where they have access to very basic medication. This gentleman was working in Las Prisas, the area we were going to go to this morning. And I uh, was working with his team cutting down um, plantains. He cut himself at 7 o'clock this morning with a machete. And uh, split open a, a serious artery right behind his leg at 7 o'clock this morning, deep in the campo. And they've only just got him out at this time here at noon. So uh, he has a long ways to go yet before he gets to Rivas, and he is bleeding. He is seriously bleeding. Um, from here to San Juan is 18 kilometers, and he has another 33 kilometers yet ahead of him before he gets, his, gets himself to a hospital. The police would have driven straight on past, not knowing what, what was uh, at stake here. My intervention was just letting him know that uh, he has to get to a hospital and quickly and not to use his heart. And then, of course, good fortune being what it is, the police just happen to be passing by. Well, the bananas, that's crop money, that's survival money for, for their family. They've, you know, that's uh, it's really important to them that they get that to market he would have been out of the bush by helicopter in Canada. And here, they've had to haul that ox cart on some really rough roads to get to this point here at Escamequita. And uh, fortunately, they have this little red truck, of course, which is going to bring the bananas to San Juan and the police truck just passed by, which will bring him directly to Rivas. A basic, you know, first aid center would be really helpful, very important. It's It's beyond the dream process, it's a goal. A very special, very special legacy to leave behind. Nicaragua is a very poor country. It's uh, the second or the third poorest country in the Western Hemisphere. And the earning power is very minimal. Therefore, poverty is a problem. I met Sor Leticia in Tipitapa, which is north here, where there was a lot of flooding, a lot of damage. 
I was uh, bringing some school supplies, friendship boxes actually, to distribute to the children. Yo trabajaba con ese amigo en des, de, a mí me mandaron a trabajar a Tipitapa para el Mich y había muchos problemas, había que construir una escuela porque habían muchos niños que eh, estudiaban debajo de árboles y este, también había mucha pobreza en Tipitapa y ese amigo me llevó a Eric para que me ayudara a trabajar. El mayor problema para mí es verme incapacitada eh, económicamente para no poderle ayudar a un pobre. Ver la necesidad de alguien que necesita mi ayuda y que por situación económica yo no le pueda ayudar. Por ejemplo, el, el comprarle materiales escolares a un, a un niño que nunca ha ido a la escuela y por no tener dinero para comprar, ese niño no va a la escuela. ¿ya? O ver a un enfermo de que no puede comprar su medicina porque no tiene dinero. Muchos enfermos en San Juan del Sur. Eric colabora bastante con, con la gente pobre. Yo siempre estoy conectándole a los pobres y llevándosela de qué manera se les podía ayudar. En visión, en estudio, en todo sentido. In most developing nations, the disabled physically challenged are seriously physically challenged. So it's not a very uh, handicap friendly country. So as a result, there's definitely some, some challenges there that uh, those that are restricted with mobility, they, they can't move around. And uh, quite often they're, they're almost um, an embarrassment to their families if they're not able to provide for their families and contribute to, uh, to the homes. Well, not far from here, just out in the fields here in Las Delicias, he was working with his dad 11 years ago. Um, they were tilling the soil, preparing to plant crops, and he cut his foot. And he cut his foot bad enough that they needed to bring him into town brought him to San Juan to the Centre de Salud and they could not stitch him up uh, so they sent him off to Rivas He spent 12 days in the Rivas hospital. In this time his foot became infected, got gangrene so they shipped him off to Managua. This is like a 10, 11 year old kid. Shipped him off to Managua and he spent six months in the hospital in Managua. His foot uh, was so gangrenous that they had to cut a portion of it away and uh, the doctor uh, decided that well they would be able to do reconstructive surgery on the foot by using flesh from his his calf on his good leg and uh, they removed the portion of calf and you know they uh, tried uh, tried Re replacing what what was what was uh, removed of, of the foot and trying to build up the, uh, the the base of the foot protect the bone that was exposed well the graft didn't take and by this time his good leg then became infected gangrenous and then uh, malpractice they cut the whole leg off so by the time this this uh, young lad gets back to his home uh, part of his foot is gone and his good leg is gone. His problem right now is the foot. It's seriously infected, seriously infected, very deformed. It's all, he cannot put pressure on it, he can't walk on it. There's uh, the heel bone is sticking out. I don't know the proper medical terms. I just know he's in pain and he needs help. And it's, uh, it's a long distance to get to town.
we wanted him to come out to San Juan because he doesn't really get out of his house much. And so the best way for him to be able to come from his house to here was on a horse. I'm living here with two friends and we all put in some money together. And he went out and picked out his own horse. We've gained a solid trust and, and, and friendship. In the course of trying to help Felix um, head back to either Canada or the States, whoever will, whoever we can facilitate medical support for his foot. We have a plane ticket and his passport, but uh, we don't have a medical facility that is willing to donate the time to, to repair his foot, be it plastic surgery, and fit him with a prosthesis. Uh, we're working on that. Well, he's a young, strong man. There's simply no reason why he cannot work with his mind and his two very good hands. He just needs some mobility. Communication, transportation, education. Those are the components that build a nation, build a family, build a life. And that's uh, what we're working on with Felix. I was building school in Cangrejo, and uh, I had seen her a couple of times in San Juan del Sur. She had a little Carolee, and I walked past and I said, oh, I said, hello, and I said, you know, oh, what a cute little, what a cute little girl, and I, you know, and Rosio smiled, and, and um, we just started talking, and, and uh, then Rosio gave me a big, bright smile, and, and uh, <laughs> After Rosio and I uh, became friends, and we decided to uh, find our own place to build our nest. Robin was born February 22nd, 2001, uh, in Rivas, Nicaragua. He made a fine entry. The weather was very, very, very dry. We were in the peak of dry season. However, on the day he was born, it rained and it rained heavy. That was a fantastic omen, I thought. I managed to convince the, one of the nurses to bring the baby out of the nursery in the incubator, and they wheeled it out and showed me, and uh, Robin had been wailing. He had been just crying and just wailing, and uh, so I knew I had a healthy boy, and they opened up the lid, and I looked at him eye to eye, and he stopped for a moment. And he just looked at me, and I looked at him, and then I started crying. And uh, I knew for sure all was going to be fine. He mentioned to me one day that um, his little stepdaughter has a friend. Lisbani is about the same size as his little six-year-old girl, and Lisbani is ten, and, and we were discussing how that came about. Lisbani has uh, third-degree malnutrition as, as a result of uh, poor diet, and she has uh, been fighting parasites. Eric explained that he'd given her some multivitamins and then they discovered she had a parasite problem and consequently she's very thin and now it's affected her eyes. The professional uh, people that we've spoken to seem to think that we can do it without any uh, eye operations, for instance. Um, we're hoping that's the case. We're taking her to a nutritionist along with her mother. Now we've also discovered her sister has the same problem, but not to the same degree. So we're going to put her sister on the same program. We'll help them out with a proper nutrition program. We have to teach the mother, of course. And I think she's starting to recognize how important it is. There's a responsibility here to, uh, to give something back. You know, we're privileged. We're privileged at home in Canada. What we have, the, uh, the hospitals, uh, the Medi Medicare we have is there. Our roads are paved, our streets are safe.
children have fantastic schools. We have the world in our hands, you know. And uh, and why is that? Well, we're privileged. We're 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 blessed. We're blessed. And. And, and, but yet we're no different from children in other nations. We're children of the universe, you know. Some of us have been here longer than others, but we're all children, and children shouldn't suffer. He's a, he's a good people manager, Eric is, you know, he's got a lot of locals committed. He's taught them that they can do what they dream about doing. He's always been adventurous, even when we were younger kids and gutsy, brave, like when we were 18, 19, he, all us friends, he, uh, they, they ran and jumped off a cliff there. I'm talking like a hundred feet high cliff into a little pool of water down below. Just him and another guy did it. One of my best friends there. He was always, he, and he was the first to go, you know, just brave. Well, I, I have uh, some children that, uh, that are certainly forefront that I have to care for and look after. I have my responsibilities to my village in um, Cangrejo and to my schools back home. You know, to my parents and to my brothers and sisters and a lot of friends, a lot of responsibility to, to the sponsors that have helped build this whole program, to, to those who believe in, in the mission of World Kids. The future of this journey continues. You know, I have my life's work here for a reason. <laughs>